Hey, everyone. Welcome back to your favorite revenue podcast. I'm your host, Ross Rich. And today we have a very special guest and we'll be digging into some of my personal favorite tips and tricks around deal execution. So Chloe must have read my mind before we uh, got started here today. But uh, yeah, today we have a uh, a special guest, Chloe Stewart, who most recently was the CRO of a company you might have heard of, Pilot.com, amazing product that we use. And before that, spent about seven plus years at Eventbrite, last as the VP of Global Sales. So a lot to learn from Chloe today. Welcome. Thanks, Ross. I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Well, before we dive into uh, nerding out on you know these tips and tricks around operationalizing deal excellence, maybe to get to know you a bit outside of my quick intro, would love to hear a bit about your path to revenue and sales leadership. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure this is a similar answer to many of your guests. I never would have imagined I'd be where I am. Had you asked me this in my early 20s, I would have said, well, what is a revenue leader? And then I would have scoffed at you when you told me the answer. Um, but revenue leadership really came to me a lot of good fortune and a lot of right time, right place. Hmm. Um, I have been in revenue roles and was as an IC for several years out of graduate school. And in so doing, really saw great revenue teams, great cultures of coaching, of enablement, of development, and then went to other companies where that wasn't so much the norm. Mm. Um, and that really made an impact, impact on me. Um, and that's really sort of what informed me to think about what would that be? What would that look like if I had my hand in that piece um, while still, you know, sort of doing the problem solving for customers, et cetera. Um, and that was sort of the impetus that drove me to, to wanting to be in the role that I continue to be in. Totally. So yeah, it sounds like uh, yeah, maybe looking at what was happening in the companies you were at and saying, we could probably do this a bit better. And I wonder if that's just, you know, me or if we could actually do this. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that definitely resonates um, with me. Uh, maybe, you know, a kind of last question on that before we shift to the tips and tricks. But, you know, after going through that journey, you know, at Eventbrite, at Pilot and thinking about your next one, what do you think the most challenging part of, that is of saying, hey, we could be engaging with customers more meaningfully, whether that's sales, whether that's CS, onboarding. What do you think the most challenging part of kind of building that team and creating a culture of, of excellence? I think that it comes down to the fact that you need to have a team that is incredibly aligned. Everyone knows exactly what the goals are and the goals have to be tied to what the business needs and what the customer needs, right? Like none of that lone wolf stuff. Yes, you want to have high performers, you want to have that competitive spirit, but you also really want a team that is so invested in the success of the team, not just themselves. That is, I think, one of the kind of primary challenges, but something that I'm really motivated by. But that's just one piece of it. The other side of that is, well, how do you make sure that that is known um, within the organization and actually like very clearly aligns to the business strategy? This needs to be a piece of that. And I think sometimes there'll be a mistake where you'll see a great revenue leader. They have a, an incredibly productive team, mm -hmm. but they're sort of on the sidelines compared to what the rest of the business may be doing. And there is that misalignment. People aren't speaking the same language. And so, of course, you have to have that high performing team where people understand the expectations they are invested and bought into that. But it has to sit within the overall organization. And so alignment, 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 it never stops. It's a continual practice. Um, and it goes outside of the walls of the revenue org. Totally. And, and, you know, we love to talk about, um, you know, kind of specifics and, and what people have learned through usually failure to get there. Like, what have you found is maybe a helpful, like, artifact or set of meetings or something that does drive that clear alignment um, of the team and their goals? Yeah, absolutely. It is really what you just said, like repetition um, is really, really important at the team level. Um, I think just making sure that everyone again, knows what are we set, what are we setting out to do? And how do I as an individual have impact on that? Like, how can I also help us reach those goals? And that practically or tactically arises in your team meetings, your one-on-ones, your all hands. And then it kind of spokes out to the entire company. So if you do a company all hands once a month or once a quarter, whatever the case may be, does the revenue team have an opportunity to remind the business of the goals. And I think sometimes when your team sees that in a different setting, it can recontextualize what it is that they're doing, but it, it, it reframes what they're doing. It still is a reminder, but it's like, oh yeah, right? And I can see that yeah. positioned within 
the company strategy, right? Because you're all hands generally with for the company, generally as a reminder to the business of like, we are here to do this this year. And our goal for five years from now is X, Y, and Z. Here's how each team is doing that and what achievement looks like today. Um, I really do think it's a, it's a constant game of reminding people, particularly when things get hard, we're all very mm -hmm. tempted to sometimes do the easy thing, but the easy thing is sometimes not the right thing. And um, if you're not constantly reminded of what you are here to do, that temptation can can kind of overpower, I think, the right thing at times. Totally. No, I, I love that. That's a helpful yeah, tip to, to remind folks is, yeah, in the, in the revenue or in the sales team, obviously, we're talking about our outcomes and where we're heading, but making sure that there's a voice at kind of the, the company level and tied to the mission and, you know, yeah, you're at the, you're the tip of the spear as a sales organization. So yeah. making sure that's uh, contextualized there. I love that. Um, awesome. Well, well, shifting gears to kind of the core of, of what we're really excited to have you here, Chloe, to talk about are some of the, the tips and tricks you have for operationalizing deal excellence. Maybe I'll just start with kind of a, a tagline for each of these, and then you can kind of share with us um, some of your, your best practices. If that sounds good. Great. Awesome. So the first one, love it. Be someone people want to buy stuff from. Yes, it all starts with the person. Yes, you might have a great product and the details are going to market motion, but like you're someone on the other end of the line, be someone people want to buy stuff from. Love it. Number two, hold yourself accountable to outcomes and benchmarks. Kind of think ties back to kind of what you were just talking about in terms of like contextualizing what you're doing and making sure you're kind of focused on the data. And then lastly, we'll talk about love this framing that you had is discovery is a lifestyle qualification is life or death. We'll get into some of that life or death stuff at the end, but to kick things off, what, what do you mean by be someone people want to buy stuff from and why is that so important? Absolutely. If you have a business where there's a sales team, there's a customer success team, there's a reason for that, right? Otherwise everyone would be PLG or self-serve. And if you, for whatever reason, are there to help your buyer, uh, to help your customer, and don't prioritize the whim, prioritize the relationship there, right? Mm. Because you're not going to win everything. No one has a 100% win rate. If they did, they wouldn't probably have a sales team. They wouldn't need one. Um, yeah. But I think about it, I'll ask my team, hey, when was the last time you bought something from somebody? And it was a good experience, enjoyable, satis satisfactory, um, pleasant, whatever you want. Like, what was that? And this question is so different now than it was like a decade ago, because now you can buy so much more stuff, you know, online, D2C, B2C, et cetera. You don't have to talk to a human. So it's actually kind of a better question to ask now than it even was a decade ago because the experiences mm -hmm. are, are, are uh, less frequent. Um, what was it about that experience that was great? Or did you have to talk to a person? Like you would buy, buy the thing no matter what, but you still had to talk to somebody to do it, right? Was that painful? Um, what about it was painful? Or was that actually more helpful than you thought it would be? Why was that? Like really thinking about yourself, but on the reverse side, I think it'd be very helpful for sales people, for customer success people to, to think about. Mm -hmm. And then how are you doing that and showing up in your own process? Um, and you can do things tactically, like think about your sales stages and how they're named. If it's named, you know, Proposal. Is that what your buyer is expecting that stage to really entail? Like really just think about it rhetorically too, because your buyer is also going through each stage with their own set of mm -hmm. agenda items, right? Their own needs there. And I think that that alignment is really important when it, sh when it shows up for how you're actually being somebody that somebody wants to buy from. I have another example here that I will never, ever forget when I was at Eventbrite. We had a salesperson on our team who knew our product in and out. And that's important. Being that subject matter expert is so, so key because somebody might not even know what they're looking for and you have to help them pull that out, right? And she did such a phenomenal job of figuring out early if like we could do the thing that the customer, prospective customer wanted and she would really guide them through or be upfront and say, that's not how we do it, here's why. And mm -hmm. if that person said, we aren't ready to do it the way that you all do it, like 60% of the time they would come back a year later or six months later and say like, hey, I haven't stopped thinking about that interaction. And I think we might be ready to explore how we do it the way Eventbrite does it. And like, how powerful is that, right? Because this person remembered what it was like to talk to her and she was so transparent and she was so honest and she was so confident, right? She wasn't scared about it. 
that she created this experience that somebody actually decided we might change the way we operate in order to work with you. Like that's just so badass and so powerful. And I think about that um, and it's an example I share with my teams of you might not win the deal today, but it's such a good experience, not just for you, but for your brand as well. And as a revenue leader, you always have to think about your brand there too. Um, so yeah, I think about that piece. I also think about when you sell something that people do need and they have to talk to you. How is that helping? You're just an order taker. How is that helping your own skill set? So when you do move up market or into a new vertical or somewhere where it's not as established, how are you really investing in yourself to uh, to kind of keep your chops going, right? And so, yeah, I just think that that's a really good self-reflection exercise. Totally. It's funny. Those, those examples remind me of um, what I always think about, like a great um, dining experience where someone you're coming and like, they're guiding you, especially if it's like a nicer meal, they're like guiding you through making the most of that experience and time with your partner, potentially your family of like, here's the stuff we love. If you like this stuff, like just very prescriptive. And you're like, wow, you made my life so easy. And I didn't feel like you were telling me what to do, but you were kind of like guiding me. Hey, if you like this stuff. And that's what I think about like the best sellers do like the woman you were just sharing example of is like, Hey, I'm going to just take you through this experience. Yeah. And I think that's the ideal kind of seller consultative expert level. I so agree. I mean, like as a salesperson, I'm, that's what I do for a living, right? Like that is my job. I don't want to talk to a salesperson half the time. And like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like turning my back on my own people when I say that. Right. And so that's a great example of like help eliminate some of the choices for me. And sometimes that means, and we'll get to this for my third tip, but sometimes that means that you're eliminating yourself as that choice, mm -hmm. right? Um, but people don't want to spend hours and hours doing this. Even in enterprise, people are trying to figure out, like, how do I make this a more straightforward decision? Um, and that really comes down to how you guide your buyer, as you just said. Totally, totally. So the last part of this question, and what I find always the hardest part is like the setting this as a standard. How does it become your culture, right? How do you not just have, you know, um, Susan, who's amazing at that, do it, but like the rest of the team and that's the, the expectation. How do you yeah. think about building a culture around that and setting that as the expectation that we're focused on not just closing deals that are ready today, but we're going to have far more pipeline because people are going to come back to us the way we're approaching it. How do you think about orienting your team around that, that skill set? Totally. And this goes into the like why qualification standards are so, so important and why everyone needs to like live and breathe those because you're not wasting time there. And it comes down to that rigor and the kind of the repetition that we were talking about earlier. Is everyone within your org aware of what is a qualified opportunity, mm. right? Like if you think about ideal customer profile, how deep can you go in that? What are your buyer personas? What are the technical aspects and specifications that you need to know? And this again goes back to like, if I'm somebody that I want people to want to buy from, I need to know all of that, right? Otherwise I feel like I'm wasting my time. Um, and so it really comes down into like, what are those at bats every week, which for me can show up in deal reviews, can show up in team meetings, can show up in Pipeline reviews, one-on-ones, et cetera, your enablement strategy, your coaching strategy. It's again, that reminder and making sure that people can in their sleep tell you what is a qualified um, you know, prospect for, for your business. Um, and you just have to continue to, to repeat that over and over and over. It has to be super predictable. And I think the team, once they really sort of you know, internalize that, they're not going to waste time on you know, leads that aren't the right fit, whether that's forever or today. And that mm -hmm. can be scary, right? Because like, even if yeah. you, you sometimes we talk to leads who are like, oh no, I really want to use a cord, Ross. Like, I love what you do. You know, Chloe referred me to you and you're like, uh, oh, like I, we, we don't fit with you for X, Y, and Z. Like you need the team to feel confident in that and not be seduced or tempted to take it. And that just, again, it's like, you have to remind them of that. And that temptation can be really strong sometimes to do the not right thing, particularly yeah. when you have a revenue target hanging over your head, you know, but it's bad for everyone. It's bad for the customer. It's bad for the brand. It's bad for your CS team, et cetera. Um, and so you really have to ensure that that compliance shows up in yeah. the routine. No, I, I love that. And I think um, one thing that you mentioned was kind of the confidence or conviction of reps when you know what the good or bad customer looks like, I think yes. um, it really helps them understand, not just be out there pitching, 
but like looking for problems to solve that are very specific. So I, I really think that that's a, that's a great point as well. Um, totally. Like, just like, don't yeah. let them waste time on that. And, and also like, don't, I think about this too, but when that's unclear, your rep is spending an inordinate amount of time thinking about what is the right answer. And they're not spending their time selling, retaining, expanding, doing the right thing for the business, doing the right thing for the customer. And that's just such a bad use of, of your brain space, right? There's only so many hours in a day where you get to do customer or prospect facing activities, orient them around that and take the thinking out of the stuff that like they shouldn't have to be responsible for. Totally. Totally. Couldn't agree more. Um, well, shifting gears over to your tip number two, which was holding yourself accountable to outcomes and benchmarks, focusing on the data. What do you mean by that? And how do you think about orienting your team around um, that accountability to outcomes? Totally. And I think this is probably a super straightforward one, but it, I think our theme is sort of like, you know, rinse and repeat. <laughs> yeah. The really boring stuff, like the most successful Revenue leaders and sellers and CS people are those who are the most consistent. It's like so unsexy, but like I, I like will live and die Let by that, you know? Yeah. I think, you know, when I was a revenue, oh, way back in the day, when I first got into like revenue management, there weren't as many tools or tech available, right? And so like you learn how to work within the limitations. Now I actually really feel for our frontline managers in particular who have so many options at their fingertips. Because what that does is it allows that person to get really like lost in dashboards and you really begin to sort of swim within a lot of data. And that is actually not what your job is to do. So really aligning, not just your team, but the business, your ops team, your CFO, your you know, marketing leader, et cetera, to those KPIs, they're key for a reason is mm -hmm. absolutely crucial. Then you know what you're working toward. It should be leading and lagging. Your team understands what they should be working toward, but ultimately, as you noted, they should align to the outcomes that you need to see within that time period. That is so crucial, right? And time period is key to whatever your sales cycle is, whatever your retention cycle is, like it has to be within those parameters. Otherwise you're spending your wheels and you won't hit your targets and the board gets mad and you get fired and all that fun stuff, right? So aligning on, hey, these are the handful of data points, benchmarks, KPIs, et cetera, that we are all going to rally around. Mm -hmm. We know the definitions. We know how they're measured. Win rate, as an example, can be quite controversial because win rate can be defined differently, right? And if you're not yeah. aligned from lead, there, from stage one, up. stage two, whatever, how you exactly. qualify thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, like all these things. So it's like, sure, it sounds really easy on paper that like a handful of KPIs, like, no, you have to understand the definition. They have to be really durable. The measurement has to be clear and everyone has to understand the importance within the time frame. Then again, it allows your team to just really think about executing, right? Mm -hmm. That's really, really key. Um, so anyway, key benchmarks that are aligned to outcomes um, that everyone is sort of aligned around is very important. Totally. And if you had to, let's say pick one leading and one lagging indicator period of your team, let's say bid market type sales process. It's not huge enterprise. It's not one call close. What do you think the kind of yeah, durable metric would be that just kind of shows you the truth of, of the business and how you're performing as a sales organization? Totally. I mean, the three that I always really stick to that I think are the most important, just sort of like generally are yeah. win rate. And again, you can measure that very differently depending on where you're at. Win rate, um, deal size. And that, of course, can really depend on if you're verticalized, if you're, you know, if you're a horizontal platform, as an example, uh, what your segment is, et cetera. And then time to close. Mm -hmm. Like to me, data points don't matter if they don't exist within your sales cycle. Um, that is time kills all deals. That's how you get to your number, et cetera. So those are the three that I think are the, for me, the, those that I rally around the most and the most frequently and that I care that my team knows. If I go to a seller on my team and I say, I want your win rate, your time to close in your deal size, they should be able to tell me that in a second. Um, those are my three that I kind of live, live and die by. Totally. Um, that, that makes a ton of sense. And it's kind of the classic revenue equation, right? You think about Oh, plus pipeline equals kind of your, you of know, your number. Um, yes. Are there any that you think are that that you've seen people use that might be like pointing folks in the wrong direction? Any metrics that are like, hey, I see people tracking this and I don't know how real it is, or maybe within those numbers, how people are tracking that kind of points you, you know, maybe to not reality. Totally. So you mentioned pipeline, like pipeline is 
everything. You know, I think sometimes we spend a lot of time looking at um, deals in late stages, et cetera, deals that already have a pro proposal, et cetera. Um, and you're going to hurt yourself in the long run if you don't understand your pipeline equations of how much pipeline do you need at any given time by stage, et cetera. So like really knowing the ins and outs of pipeline health is, is crucial. It's critical. Um, that, of course, ties to things like win rate, but also things like conversion rates and your your loss and win by stage. Right. So that is something that is super huge. And with marketing in particular, you all need to be in lockstep right? you have to be incredibly aligned. That is one that I think people miss out on or don't dig as deeply into. Um, I think a, a set of metrics that people can over index on would be activity metrics. Mm. So, and that yeah. is like, I think particularly uh, more relevant today or irrelevant, I should say, because especially when it comes to outbounding, like what does that even mean? And we'll sometimes conflate activity with results and activity should drive results, but they're not two in the same or one in the same. Totally. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great call out, um, especially seeing the response rates and, and everything yeah. from cold outbound done in kind of a, a classic way these days. Um, couldn't agree more. So shift into the last piece that we're going to talk about, um, something that seems like uh, near and dear to your heart, which is uh, yeah, qualification, that discovery is a lifestyle, but qualification is life or death. What do you mean by that? Why is qualification <laughs> uh, the life or death of a sales organization? Totally. Um, I think there's been tons of work done in discovery, which is awesome. Discovery, I consider a lifestyle. A lot of people, you know, get corny like I do. It's something that happens through every part of your customer journey or your, you know, your prospective buyer's process. It starts with marketing, how they're learning about what you're doing, right? They're discovering. It starts with, or it starts with, you know, your your sales team, your SDR team. How are you aligned on? what it means to, what a needs analysis is versus a wants analysis. It keeps going post sale for retention and expansion. Like discovery just is a constant and has to be. And if you don't think about it that way, like you're in trouble. Qualification, when I say is life or death, like don't chase bad deals and don't put your team in a place where they are going after bad deals and are incentivized to do that, right? Um, it kills your business. It's so bad for your brand. Your customers, I, ideally, you're creating some sort of customer flywheel where you have referrals, you have some sort of morality, like you have word of mouth. That's huge for a business, right? When it comes mm -hmm. to, to growth. If you have, if you put a customer into a bad experience, they're going to share that with everyone they know. That kills you, right? Uh, you don't want that as a brand. And then you're also setting up your retention team for just massive failure. You're putting this team in a really hard spot. There's been so much work as of late done around modernizing CS teams. I'm so into this work right now. How can you do that? How can you really elevate or reshape the role of CS if they're just trying to, you know, work bad shaped deals? It's just, it's just unfair. So qualification to me has to be incredibly straightforward complied by, understood by everyone and sh can show up in, in every, you know, question that you're asking, um, your, your reps. Totally. Which, which brings us to, we were talking about this in our, in our prep session, the kind of question on the top of everyone's head, which is why are reps so afraid of saying no to deals, mm -hmm. right? Like they know deep down, I'm going to waste time on this thing. It's happened before we all get it, but it's so freaking hard to say no to someone who is down to talk to you when you spend so much time reaching out and not getting responses. So, you know, what do you think is that reason and how do you kind of orient teams around uh, not doing some of those practices that are not going to get them paid? I totally, I mean, there's like, there's so many, so many, like, I think answers to this. I think that the two main ones that come to mind, one is sales is really emotional. It's like a very psychological and emotional and mental game. It requires people. It requires relationships. Like that's, that's messy. That's hard. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to disappoint somebody. It's just, it's just difficult sometimes to say no to somebody when they are interested in chatting with you. It's also just so hard. Sales is so hard. I think particularly coming out of 2023 and late 2022, we know how much more difficult this is mm -hmm. um, and trying to generate pipeline, especially with how outbounding has transformed post 2019, honestly, and starting in 2020, yeah. like, it's just a grind. And in order to be a strong salesperson, one of those attributes that people tend to have is this optimism, like you have to believe 
that you can do it, right? And that you're going to do it. And if you have a ton of no's, you have to get used to being, you know, hearing no all the time, right? But if you have so many no's, one person says yes, but just, it's just, from a, being a person, it's just so hard to turn it down. So I think that's that's just one piece that just sort of is like very complicated and complex. Totally. Like probably didn't do a good job articulating it. Because the other piece is, it's a numbers game. Like most AEs, this is a this is a generalization, so forgive me, but most AEs are on a comp plan where they're 50% base, 50% variable comp, right? And that's hard. If you have a family, if you have a mortgage, if you have student loans, whatever, like that's a lot of risk. And so sometimes when you've done something that has worked even, you know, 30% of the time, it's so hard to stop doing that because it worked. Yeah. It worked once or twice, you know, even if you know it's not the right thing. Because again, like your paycheck's on the line. Um, and so I think that those are some of the, the, the factors that make it really difficult to, to, say, to say no. And I think particularly now, sales is really hard. Um, and we're coming out of the golden years of like 2021 where like people were buying things like just lighting money on fire, you know? And so for teams that kind of came of age during that year, this is a totally different ball game. Um, and it, it just requires a very different mind shift. And that's why it's so important that the business, not just the team and the frontline managers, rally with those AEs, with those CSMs, with those SDRs. Like you really have to treat it as a team sport to keep that motivation going, I think. Yeah, you bring up a really interesting point around like the psychology for both of those pieces in terms of both the comp structure as well as the the chasing deals that people want to talk to you, just kind of the, the emotional aspect of it is I've heard a lot about teams cutting the number of sellers and almost overfeeding the top performers because they want a winning culture that leads mm -hmm. to the confidence of not necessarily needing to chase certain deals. And I think that's been a really interesting kind of like newer thing I've heard of teams doing in the last couple of quarters where, Hey, we actually have less, like don't have the capacity we need, but we're actually closer to hitting the goals that we have yeah. because we're forcing our reps to actually work a smaller number of deals because we know that they're top performers, but they're overfed. So they need to only focus on the top, top deals and they have the highest win rates versus having if those other leads went to someone else who was chasing a bunch of stuff uh -huh. and doing an effective outbound, you know, they're not even getting done in the first place. So that's been a really interesting, I think, like shift I've seen um, from like a model perspective. Absolutely. And, it's, you, and I, you're so right where it's like, it's also a way to keep those high performers engaged and to feel invested in, right? Like that's, to your, as you just said, like psychologically, that is so important. I think what is interesting about this model is how are you also balancing that with your future needs, right? Like when do things get back to whatever, right? Like nothing will ever be like 2021 again, like let's get real, but like when people are ready to buy more and people have budgets and CFOs are releasing that budget, do you actually have enough people to, to do that? And also is the expectation of your board of investors from a revenue perspective, tied to what the team can actually produce. And sure, yes. maybe today that's the right thing to do, but how are you actually creating your hiring plan and your go to market plan to, to be future forward? And that, that can be, um, it's like an interesting conundrum right now, but a really fun one. Totally. Yeah. How do you balance the, the here and today and the now with the, yeah. you know, with the inevitable future? Um, cool. Before we wrap up this awesome session, um, we have a few, we call our rapid fire, uh, response questions where we're going to ask for either one word or one sentence answers to a few questions. Are you ready, Chloe? Oh gosh. I mean, <laughs> one word or one sentence. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I know sales leaders asking them to answer things with brevity. This is not a, this is not an engineering <laughs> uh, show. We're going to have to see the comparison on that one. But uh, the first one, tricky one, main reason most teams miss their ARR targets. Lack of alignment. Yes, I think tying back to what you said at the start, that is a great answer. Uh, what is your favorite resource related to revenue leadership? Could be a book, a course, a podcast, anything. Okay, I have three, so I'm already breaking the rules here. Uh, <laughs> Old-fashioned get-togethers with people who are doing the job that you're doing. My God, it's like, you know, food for the soul. Um, this podcast is terrific. I can't recommend your podcast enough. And then finally, for me, selfishly, I'm a big Chris Walker fan, like just listening to his podcast, reading of what he has to write, um, it really helps me kind of stay somewhat finger on the pulse of the marketing world. Yeah, no, he, yeah, that's a really, really great um, 
podcast so check that one out um the uh yeah number one challenge for revenue leaders in 2024 oh my gosh again i think it's having a plan in period <laughs> a durable plan though and a plan that again is sort of um, aligned to the strategy of the business and ultimately one that reflects how your customer what they need and what they want to buy yeah yeah orient around that is definitely hard to to keep up with uh yeah the shifting in uh market dynamics uh here we got some lighter ones though uh your favorite segment to sell into smb mid-market or enterprise I mean, mid-market all day, baby, but I love all of my segments equally. It's like asking for my favorite child. Um, I have probably the most experience in mid-market and just can jam out with those folks, probably the, the best. Yeah, no, my my personal preference is that as well. I mean, you get like sophisticated buyers. It's not quite enterprise yes. where you're just dealing with people that are so siloed um, yes. and a bit more sophisticated than the high velocity SMB. Like I love to win. I love winning and an enterprise. Sometimes it's a lot of losing. Totally. Totally. Uh, another similar one, most important organization on the revenue team, sales, CS or marketing. One and the same. They should all be part of a singular org. Okay. Very diplomatic answer. <laughs> um, last one to wrap up with, uh, what is your uh, favorite way to unplug from the demands of revenue leadership? I, really enjoy spending time with folks, like with my peers, right? And so whether that's within the company, meeting your, you know, uh, VP of product or your chief product officer, like spending time there is just so fulfilling and so important. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone should do that. If you're a head of sales, like spend time with your head of product or whatever, like that's just really, really important. It takes some of the leadership pressure off of you for day to day, but you're still learning and you're still aligning. And then touch grass, like get outside, change your perspective, go look at the sky or water. I mean, that sounds so corny, but like really it, it makes the brain start doing different stuff. Yeah. Unplugged for sure. Uh, well, this was awesome. Action, action packed session, Chloe. Really appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to share some of these tips and tricks with the community. And uh, yeah, thanks a ton.